Hello, hello, everybody. This is John Park, and we're live. Welcome to John Park's workshop. I'm John Park. Hello, this is my workshop. Oh my gosh, I'm going to give you a terrible echo. Whee! There we go. Let me fix that. <laughs> All right, I should calm it down a bit. That freaked me out. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm John Park. This is my workshop, and we are here today on Adafruit. Uh, you are probably watching on the YouTube, Twitch, Periscope, Facebook, that's where we're broadcasting today, and the comments are live in Discord. So uh, check out Discord for lots of great conversation and commentary, questions, warnings you can give me as you watch me prepare to do something terribly, terribly wrong as I'm working here today in the workshop. Uh, and we are also in the YouTube uh, channel. Let me check the chat out over there real quick. Uh, but you got to make sure you don't watch yourself on delay on video or you get sucked into a black hole and that's bad. So, uh, yeah, here's the chat. Oh, it wants me to say got it. I got it. Hi. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> hey, Alansky, no more burning trinket, huh? So, yeah, if you follow me on social media... Uh, I don't think I posted this on anywhere else, but uh, if you look on social media, maybe Adafruit reposted this one, I can't recall, but after last, last week's episode, uh, working on this same project, the Chill Drinky Bot, I had a terrible accident, uh, not terrible accident, but I had a, a bit of a meltdown there where I burned up the microcontroller I was using, and I will show you that uh, and talk about what went wrong there and how you can prevent doing the same. It was just a stupid mistake. It actually had nothing to do with the circuit, just an unintentional circuit I made when I was being uh, quick and sloppy with some connections, temporary connections. So uh, we'll talk about that. We will go over the uh, slightly adjusted circuit, very, very slight adjustment on the circuit today uh, for this project. And then we'll mostly uh, go about looking at the enclosure uh, that I've built for it or the stand that I've built to, to uh, complete the drinky bot. And then we'll fire it up. Um, so let's see, so that you know what I'm talking about here a little bit, let's start with this. So if you check out this image here, this is the sort of prototype stage version of the Drinky Bot. That's what I was uh, working on uh, last week. And I didn't get it that cold last week uh, when I was building it live on air. And I think it was a couple of things really the biggest thing is patience, being able to take the time, at least five minutes, to get uh, some, some nice chilling effect on the delightful beverage that you've got in your container there on top of the cooler. Um, backing up a second, if you're joining us live and you're like, what is he talking about? What the heck is the chill drinky bot? Uh, let me pop to this camera for a second. So, chill drinky bot is a cooler for cooling off a beverage when you don't have or don't want to use ice cubes, which can dilute things, uh, and you want to do kind of a made-to-order drink. So this could be for a high-tech lemonade stand. Uh, this could be for a uh, cocktail that you're making to order or a tiki drink to, you're making to order. Uh, and the idea is instead of trying to make the thing and maybe put it in a refrigerator or a freezer and chill it, uh, we are using the uh, thermoelectric cooling effect of something called a Peltier cooler. And the Peltier cooler, if you look at um, this image again, you see I have a little pitcher, it's actually a syrup pitcher, uh, on the upper right corner that has a clothespin and some tubes and wires going into it. Uh, that's, uh, right now that contains about two ounces of uh, liquid, and it is sitting on top of a little plate that is white, and that's white right now because of frost. So. Uh, that little plate is then sitting on top of a heat sink, that large aluminum chunk, which has a fan under it. Uh, and the reason is that little plate is a type of thermoelectric cooler called a Peltier cooler. It uses two different materials that have different thermoelectric properties. And when you introduce a current across them, uh, heat goes to one side and cold goes to the other side of the materials, so you end up with a lot of hot air coming out of the bottom in this case that we're sinking to that big aluminum heat sink and that we are venting off that air with a fan. 
uh, actually we're blowing onto it. We're, we're pulling ambient air onto the onto the heat sink to, to chill that, uh, uh, cool that heat off a bit. But then the opposite side of it is getting really, really cold. Um, and that's why you see the frost in this picture here. So the uh, Drinky Bot uses a 12 volt power supply to, uh, th that's rated at five amps in order to accomplish this. Uh, and so rather than just hook the thing up straight to the wall uh, or to a, to a adapter rather, don't put it in the wall, uh, with a 12 volt uh, five amp power supply, uh, we are making a device that has a microcontroller connected to it so that we can um, run some software, this is CircuitPython software running on a trinket, that will read a few things uh, and give us the results we want for the workflow of the project. So the way it's set up, we're going to read a button and press the button. The button will light up to tell us that the system is running. It has a little integrated LED in the button we're using. And it will uh, send a signal to a type of transistor called a MOSFET. And this is a power MOSFET that can essentially act like a solid state switch. So we send a little signal from the trinket that says, yeah, go ahead. That lets the 12 volt uh, 5 amp current go pouring through. And we have two of those circuits. So one of them will run our chiller for a little while, uh, five, 10 minutes. It works really, really well. If you have the patience for it, you'll get a really nice cold drink. Um, and I'll talk about some numbers. I'll show you some of the values I got, and we'll, we'll do a live demo here. And uh, then after it's run, it's going to uh, run the, the chiller. It's going to stop the chiller, and then it's going to run a little pump, a little peristaltic pump to take the beverage out of the vessel and put it into your drinking glass. So that's the idea behind the project in case you're catching up uh, and weren't here last week. So uh, let's see. The uh, let me see, are there any questions in the chat? I thought I saw someone. Yeah, so <laughs> Matambala says we could invert that chip and use it in the winter to heat up the cocoa. I love that idea. Someone mentioned, I think C. Grover uh, mentioned last week that you could put an H-bridge, which is a type of um, uh, amplifier circuit that can uh, switch the polarity, essentially. So it's a solid state uh, device that would allow our DC, which currently is uh, headed to the Peltier, to keep the cold side on the top and the hot side on the bottom. And the H bridge can flip that for us, uh, which would be pretty cool. So we could send a signal from the, uh, uh, the microcontroller saying, hey, I'm in hot cocoa mode now, which would be kind of cool. Um, let's see, other questions. Let me switch over to the chat view here. Um, and I've also got YouTube chat. You're gonna, I don't wanna suck you in a black hole, so let's try to avoid seeing whew, that which we are already seeing. Um, so Olansky asked the weather. Actually, it's not hot anymore. It's about, uh, I don't know, 68 degrees or something today. So I'm not in as much a need for cold beverage, but one idea, so, so this project is family friendly, of course. You can make, like I said, some lemonade cold with it or whatever you like. Um, if you like a chilled adult beverage, and, and some people like to chill off uh, a glass of scotch before they drink it, I've gotten, you've probably seen these little um, stones that you leave, they look like ice cubes, they're little stones that are cut into, cleaned up and cut into ice cube shapes. And you leave them in your freezer and that way you can put them into some scotch and it will chill it without diluting it with water. You may drip a little water in too if you want to get it to an exact dilution. Uh, but this is another thing, uh, you could use this any time of the year to cool off a beverage. Um, for those of you who are interested in that sort of thing. So, but let's keep it family friendly. All right, so let's uh, take a look now at a little accident I had. Um, we'll start off with, here's an image of the damage uh, area or the blast radius. You see I've started to scrape off some of the soot from a little bit of a fire and some smoke uh, that happened on my trinket board. And if you take a look at this image here, uh, you'll see that the chip, uh, the uh, M0 chip on the trinket has a little hole burned into it and there's some melty bits around there. Here's the back side of it. You can see some definite damage. Um, and the way this happened was that I had some connections that I wasn't making permanently while I was working on it. And actually the main reason for this is that I knew I was gonna be building an enclosure and some buttons and switches and things would have wires that need to be fed through the enclosure and then the, um, 
object set into the front of it with the wires on the other side. So I didn't want to solder things, so I was just twisting things together temporarily. Uh, this one, in fact, in this case, was the Peltier cooler and the fan. They both are connected to the same 12-volt supply uh, that then runs to a switch. But I had just taken the wires and twisted them up like you do, um, like so. So I just took some wire, did this kind of thing, and set it on my workbench. Uh, problem was, at one point, that contacted my switch, um, which, let me pull a switch out of this thing here to show you. All right, that one's a pain to get out. Let me get a different switch. Just so you can see exactly what happened here. All right, we'll pretend it was this one. So, switch was connected to my circuit board, uh, my Perma Proto board, but resting on my workbench was that twisted set of wires carrying 12 volt. And these two guys happened to touch each other. Uh, and it sent 12 volts because everything was kind of grounded and all part of the same circuit. It sent 12 volts up one of the digital pins uh, on my poor little trinket, which, you know, it's a $9 thing. So it's not the worst that could have happened. It didn't destroy everything else on it. So not too much work was lost. Uh, so I ended up desoldering that trinket uh, and then put a new trinket on to the pins that I already had on my Perma Proto board. So it was actually pretty quick to repair. And you see also in this image, I then stopped twisting wires together from that point going forward. I still wasn't ready to make permanent connections. We'll do that maybe today. But I used these little snap action nuts. So these are, these are great. Uh, these, this one in, in this case is a five conductor. So any wire you put in here, it's as if you've twisted them all together, except you get this nice beefy lever. These can handle a ton of current, uh, and they are a much, much smarter choice than twisting wires together like I was doing. So lesson learned, and I hope that is helpful to you. Those things are called, uh, I think, snap action lever wire nuts. Uh, you'll also find there's a brand name Wago, W-A-G-O. That's a generic, I mean, people use that name a lot. It's not genericized yet, like Kleenex, uh, I guess. Maybe Kleenex isn't either, but you get the idea. You might, if you're looking for those, talk, uh, look for Wago nuts. But we sell a five conductor version and a three conductor version in the Adafruit store. So check those out. They're very cool. Uh, and also someone said on uh, social media, that there's a, a newer one that's like see-through, so you can see everything in there, which sounds kind of kind of cool. Uh, okay, so let's get now to the uh, changes I made to the circuit. So you can see here... Um, everything, let's see, is this, this will be easier if I do it as a real, let me pull up fritzing on my second screen here so I can drive around it a little. If I remember last time driving, driving fritzing was weird. It didn't like being squished so small or something. Let's see. Uh, are you going to work? Yeah, it's working. Okay. So uh, this, I won't go over everything in the circuit, but the, the rough overview is the trinket can send little signals to this MOSFET circuit and this MOSFET circuit, which then talk to our Peltier and cooling fan or our pump, depending. I added this capacitor here because I was having a little bit of a stall sometimes. In fact, at the end of the last session, I was trying to run, I think, the, the cooler and then the pump, or maybe both at the same time, and the pump wasn't running. Um, the, I thought I had miswired something. I looked to no, know I hadn't. It was wired okay, but I was just needing uh, more current on demand than I was getting from my power supply. So I put a nice big uh, capacitor on there, which gives us, it's really great with DC motors when you have problems. It can smooth out um, noise in the circuit and uh, to, to place a capacitor across the leads. Or in this case, it's kind of like your, your car uh, battery being able to kick the motor into gear at the very start when it's overcoming the inertia of sitting still. That draws a ton of current, so sometimes that will make a power supply fail. So that addition there is uh, getting my pump working nicely. And then you also see I have these toggle switches, and these are also something they have in the store, uh, in the Adafruit store. Um, I love these switches, and they're not only big great beefy switches. They're made for cars, I think, for modifying, like adding your own lights and stuff if you want to add toggles to your dashboard. I think that's one of the primary uses. Uh, and these have an integrated LED in the stock uh, of the on-off toggle, so you can um, 
use that as a power indicator is how I'm using it in this case. So by simply keeping the circuit as it was, but grounding this uh, negative leg of the switch, and it's already got power supplied through to the positive and out this one, which is called headlamp sometimes, it's kind of this D symbol. By running uh, the voltage that's 12 volt through there, this LED is rated for 12 volts. Uh, so I didn't use a resistor, I probably should have because it's pretty bright, but to keep things simple. I just grounded uh, the power supply um, or the whole circuit through to this negative leg on the toggle. And now it lights that switch when the switch is in the on position, allowing the, the power to run through. So it's a nice way to know without any programming, nothing in the microcontroller, just I've got power to the system. Uh, and then we're using this button down here uh, as the actual go, you know, do your thing button. Uh, okay, so any questions about that? Hit me in the uh, comments. Greg says killer switch. Yeah, I love these things. In fact, it was something I had asked Lamar if we could carry in the store when I first started because I had some ideas for projects. And the first one I did using them, I think, was the Crypto Countdown case, uh, which is a puzzle box, a mystery box uh, that has five switches, these kind of cool detonator switches with the covers on them. Oh, Agent Smith in Discord says, I almost melted that kind of power jack when I was drawing three amps at 12 volts. My contactless thermometer said it was 42 degrees C. Uh, that's a, a good point. I will check it and see if it's hot. I actually didn't check what that's rated for. I'm using fairly beefy wire all over the place where I can, um, where I'm running that bigger current. Um, so yeah, when you get into these bigger current things, you kind of have to check. My MOSFETs were getting hot. Um, so hot, in fact, because the breadboard that I had it on originally wasn't rated for this kind of current. And so I, uh, as I ran it for like a number of minutes to see how, how far I could chill it, the, I could smell the MOSFETs getting hot. And then actually I think what I was smelling was the breadboard melting. I looked and I had some slightly melty parts of the breadboard. So uh, I'm writing the guide for this right now. And in it I say, you know, if you're gonna test this on a breadboard before you put it on a Perma Proto board, uh, do it in just like a few seconds here and there, but you're gonna you want to get it off the breadboard. Uh, another thing I have that I'll show is I got some little clip-on heat sinks for the MOSFETs. I actually don't think they're getting that hot anymore, but I'll throw them on there just for kicks, uh, and you'll see that. Um, Caleb, toggle switches. Yes, Caleb. Yes. Okay, Alansky, you got class at five. CNC, hey, go enjoy your CNC class, and thanks for stopping by. Appreciate it. Okay, so uh, let's get over to the workbench and start putting some stuff together. Um, I'm gonna head over here and what we have to do today is essentially put it together in its final form. So uh, if you look here, I'm gonna switch um, let me switch my iPad over to Discord. I can't seem to split. I forget what they changed it, like in just the latest version, how you split between two screens on iPad between two apps. I had side-by-side -side YouTube and Discord chats going on here before. If anyone knows, let me know. Um, it was just swipe from the side before, and now that doesn't do it. So um, let me show you this, which is what we're headed towards. So I made this, let's see here. I made this little stand, and it's not quite an enclosure. It actually, the purpose it serves is to kind of keep everything together in one spot. Um, and it keeps the fan up off the ground so that we're able to suck in air. Uh, it seems to work well here. If needed, this could be, these could be taller legs if we felt like we were restricting airflow. But I've got the back open, front open, and sides have a little bit of vent. So, so it can pull in your ambient air to cool off the heat sink. Um, the rest of the parts, essentially the breadboard uh, or the, the Perma Proto is gonna go on the back here. And then I've panel mounted everything else. So I decided the fan, uh, so the pump looks kind of cool. Um, might as well have it out front here. My idea is that we'll have our, switch to this camera, or switch to point at that camera. We'll have our chilling vessel up here and I'm already forgetting which one is that. Did I already wipe that off? I think I wiped off my mark. Oh no, they're on here. Okay. I have two pumps. So the top one is output. So the, in this configuration with the pump running in this direction, this hose, and we can cut this a bit, will go to where you're gonna serve your drink. And this one, which will cut quite a bit shorter, will be the one that will draw it from the, the chilling vessel. Um, 
so that is the idea. And, and I've got some of the parts in here. Uh, a little bit of story behind this design here I wanted to show you. So what I did was I started off in cardboard. So I took, um, let's see, yeah, you might want to look at the overhead too. So I took this piece of cardboard. I fit it to the fan on the bottom. Where's my other chiller? Here it is. So I made some markings, fit this here, crudely cut out a hole. Pardon the airplane going by. And then I punched some holes for running wires through the back, my little panel mount, um, temperature gauge, the pump here, some buttons. So this gave me my general idea. Then I took better measurements and um, built uh, a little drawing in CAD. Let me show you that for a second. Building the story here. Okay, so um, this is actually something I didn't uh, end up having time to do. I was thinking about, uh, get that out of the way. I was thinking about building a little bit more as a 3D printed or with, with some slots cut into it as a uh, laser cut design to be able to have a back on it. I may still do that, but right now uh, with the amount of time I had and some, some issues with my laser cutter, which has definitely died now, the, uh, the tube on it is kaput. They have a fixed life, lifetime. They, they uh, need to be recharged, so I got to go get my, my uh, CO2 laser tube recharged. But um, So this is the basic design of it, and these are the curves that I created when I was uh, laser cutting them. You could also uh, potentially mill that, uh, mill and drill these parts, which would be kind of cool. It would be great to make the whole thing out of aluminum. I think that would be very cool. So um, maybe, maybe I'll do that. I'm actually about to do some milling for Aaron uh, St. Blaine. Adafruit uh, creator of cool stuff. So I'm going to get some thin aluminum to do some, some milling for her. So I may uh, get a little extra and try out a, a version of this in aluminum, which would be pretty cool. Um, but since I had the problem with the, uh, the laser tube going out, I said, you know what, I'm just going to, even though I designed this for that type of construction, uh, where I was going to use like acrylic glue, uh, or if it's wood, you can usually press fit or use wood glue and press fit this stuff. I said, you know, let me try to 3D print it. So here's a, uh, a piece, and it, something went wrong mid-print, so this is a little funny looking. But uh, this is a piece that I just 3D printed, and you can see, uh, you know, I've got the same tabs that you usually see in uh, this type of joinery for CNC and uh, uh, laser cutting. They fit together really well. So that's what that final stand is, is actually PLA that I... Uh, because PLA or any 3D print tends to be a little bigger. It's like the inverse kerf that you get from 3D printing. They tend to be a little bigger than your original dimensions, whereas those are exact fit in my drawing, uh, which means they will uh, have a, just a very tiny kerf between them when you laser cut stuff, so it fits together beautifully. These actually required a little bit of uh, wiggling and force to get them in, but it worked well because it's the same material. Uh, it kinda, they kind of heated each other up and friction fit a little, and it's in there really well with no, no glues at all. You could probably just use crazy glue um, if you needed to. So that's, uh, that's how I came about the design there. So let's go ahead and populate this with the real stuff now. Um, so let's take some things apart. This will help you in, in seeing how things go together, actually. Uh, so I have, let me go to the big overhead. So I have uh, these little uh, two and a half millimeter nylon screws and nuts and standoffs that I'm using to affix things. So glass out of the way. I'm going to take the pump off. And, oops. And I mentioned in my, the guide I'm working on, the actually second step that I did after uh, doing my hand-built prototype with a box cutter and cardboard uh, is I laser cut a version of it. So here you can see um, this is the precision laser cut 
cardboard. This was the last that my laser cutter worked really before it fully died. Uh, a second to last. Actually, I have somewhere around here one nice piece, the back plane of it, that I acrylic cut. Here it is. Um, and then I broke a piece of it off uh, as I was figuring out that I had made this dimension a little too small and you can't really force stuff into acrylic so I, before I changed it I had cut this and pushed it through and pushed it through so it broke that off but anyway that's that's what I wanted it to look like now I'm now I'm kind of liking this 3d printed one but that's what it would look like in acrylic um, so this is fast right and this is cheap the material is essentially free my wife gave me a bunch of cardboard that had come in the mail from something she'd ordered I think a print on Etsy so anyway cutting out of uh, Laser cutting that out of cardboard, it's not the right thickness, but it did a pretty good job of showing me how uh, the little legs would fit into here. And I was able to screw the fan into the base. This, I actually, I, I didn't have a piece of cardboard big enough, so I just set two pieces next to each other and kind of taped them. So, so this one base piece was uh, cut in half. But So that's that step. Then I went and, and moved on to this. But it, it's uh, the reason I brought that up is it's just so satisfying when you do your design, you take some measurements with some calipers, and then you go and drop it in, and everything just lines up nicely like that. Uh, really great way to confirm that things should work when you move into your more expensive materials or your slower methods, such as uh, the 3D printing, which can take a couple of hours apart in this case. Well, not, not these side pieces, but this back was a couple hours. This was an hour and some. Uh, so I'm going to pull. These were just dummy parts that I was using to double check my fit. So I'm going to pull that switch out. And again, these would fit perfectly for the laser cut version. And instead with this, I get the holes are all just a little bit small. So that, that's fine. You can kind of tap them by screwing things into them because it's soft plastic. Uh, and this is our switch here. Take that switch out. Again, you can see I'm, I just dropped that into the cardboard version because it was laser cut. This one I'm having to unscrew it, which is kind of neat. You actually don't need the nut on the back of it in this case because it's in there so firmly. And then these panel mounts uh, meters have a little clip that Oh, this is staying in. Why am I taking that out? That's staying in. That one was nice because this one has little built-on connectors. So uh, I, uh, in some of these cases, I didn't solder things to the board. Uh, in other cases, the power that runs this little uh, panel meter is soldered to the board, but it doesn't matter because it's going to clip to here. So you have to keep that in mind with some things like this switch. We're going to need to uh, clip it or desolder it, resolder it once I go through. Um, most of the stuff I made connectors or planned for that a little better. Uh, okay, so yeah, so we'll leave this cooler on. You can see I took the guard off of here for, oh, sorry, I just bumped that camera. I took the, car, the guard off of here for no particular reason. I probably should put it back on. I won't do that right now. Um, that's a good thing because it can suck up something off of your desk or you might get a finger under there. So these guards are a good idea, but I had taken that off and, and forgot to put it in when I set this in place. Uh, so, okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to run this hole back here. I don't know why I put it in there. I think uh, I had an idea originally this was going to be closer and I wanted some air to flow, but uh, that is now a pointless, maybe it's a design element, but there's no reason for that. It's actually making this thing a little flexy. Uh, I had also thought about using 8020 uh, T-slot aluminum for this. That would be another really cool way. There's a lot of ways that you can skin this cat. You mostly want to get the electronics up and away uh, from liquids. So that's why everything here is above the water line. Okay, so run, run the 12-volt uh, fan and Peltier through the back here. Uh, let's put the real circuit board in place here. So I will... Unscrew. So one thing I like using, this is, I'm using these little uh, two and a half millimeter nylon screw sets that we have uh, in the store. Uh, and it has a variety of standoffs. So I like to put the standoff and then a screw on either side. It's kind of a nice, neat way to connect things. You can also stack up, um, a, put a longer screw through and stack up a few nuts if you need to get a particular length or a, a 
a standoff and some nuts, but this one worked well with these sort of medium-sized standoffs. All right, so you go away, and now, huh, what I want to do is keep track of everything and not get these wires all tangled up as I connect this and you hopefully we'll still be able to see. Also, I did not make a real uh, neat, clever way for this uh, power plug. It's just going to hang uh, with, with the power supply. I didn't, since I don't have a back on it yet, I didn't make a place to put this. There's also, I think we have some panel mount ones that would work better than, than this uh, screw terminal one. Uh, okay, so those are going to get disconnected and fed through. I'll leave them on for now. There's those wire nuts that I used to prevent disaster. So you stay there. Uh, orientation of this thing. Let me get everything flipped. So this switch is going to go through this hole here. Wiring for the pump, same thing. Is It's actually just going to live on the back side and I can disconnect it from uh, these wire nuts. Deal with the hose. This gets off of here. I don't need you. I've got too much clutter going on here. And let's see. If I set you down right there right now like that, that one we'll deal with. We're going to desolder that uh, at the switch and resolder it. All right. Feeling good. That goes there. Wiring and interconnects. It's always like a much larger part of your project than you expect. But it's worth it because it's not like you want to roll up to your lemonade stand with a bunch of wires everywhere. Yes, Metabole says those blade edges are sharp, especially at high speeds. You really don't want to get your finger in there. That just hurts and can be dangerous. By the way, I had a great uh, success for Halloween, both of my daughter's uh, clockwork goggles that I'd built. Uh, you guys remember those clockwork sort of steampunk goggles with NeoPixel rings? They worked out great on her costume, and I also scared the heck out of some poor kids with my screaming cauldron. It really worked well. I'm sorry I didn't get any video of it, and I am feeling slightly guilty that I saw some kids looking a slightly scarred by the experience, but it's Halloween. Come on. It wasn't gory. All right, so let's start putting stuff in here. So this switch, um, I am going to maybe ream that hole a little bit because I can't twist that part in now that I've got all this wiring on it. Yeah, that'll work. I'm just going to get it in enough so that I can then put a nut on the front of it and then bring that one up there. I won't tighten it up too much right now. Okay, and then here's the other nut. I'm not using the big um, doomsday switch on it. I decided to just go with the bare toggle. Okay, that's good for now. Click, click. Good idea to not have everything plugged in while you're working, so going to see anything light up yet. Um, here, by the way, let's see if I can show you these. These are these two little um, clip-on heat sinks that I just got. Can you see those? I think these were a dollar or something. I hope I don't have that terribly wrong, but yeah, I think they were pretty cheap. So these just clip onto our MOSFETs, like so. You can also put a screw and nut through to get a, a better um, contact. You want really good contact for this thermal electric stuff. And make sure we're not shorting anything <laughs> with those. How about that? In fact, I'm not going to do that right now because I don't want to blow up the project without being super careful about it, which I can't be at the moment. But 
that's the idea. That's where those go. Uh, these aren't getting super hot for me, but if you do have a project where things are getting really hot, that'll give you a little bit more uh, relief for the, the poor little IC in there. Okay, so next up, let's run our um, power to... Oh, look at that. Did I just break this? Wow, that's weird. Look, just broke this little... I mean, it's tiny. This little 30 gauge silicone wire just popped right there. I wonder if I like had that caught under something and it got pinched and broke. But that's okay. That that's that piece that I'm the button only needs to run from there to there. So I was planning to cut and resolder those. But yeah, the silicone wire is awesome, and it's because it doesn't hold a shape and a memory, and it twists around things quicker and easier than uh, typical vinyl. Uh, and the 30 gauge stuff is really nice and thin, which is awesome. But you can see it's not as robust as it could be for that reason. Okay, so that's just going to run power to our little panel meter temperature gauge. So we'll have this kind of cool open wiring aesthetic. Not open. Yeah, semi-open, sure. Okay, so those will get soldered in. Eventually I may just clip them uh, with the wire nut today. Power is good here. That's pump. Okay, so let's run our real pump into here and deal with that wiring. So uh, right now, I was using this nut for the uh, ground on the pump. So this purple is the ground on the pump. Remind me of that when I forget in a moment. Um, and so someone asked me, is the circuit PWM for the fan in the cooler? Does it do temperature sensing? So um, no, I'm not PWMing the fan in the cooler. I'm simply uh, opening up the floodgates for the 12 volt, 5 amp current with that MOSFET. So uh, when I hit the button, the software little circuit Python code says, just run that for X number of minutes. I think I have it set to five minutes right now. I'll double check the code. Um, and then it shuts that off. So I'm not trying to hit a particular temperature using, uh, you know, watching the temperature and, and, and keeping on until we reach a threshold. That would be great. This is actually not a, a sensor that I can plug into the Arduino. This is just a, like a, having a thermometer sitting there. So it's just for, for your um, information, but it's not something that's being used inside the circuit. I love that idea. I think that's really cool. And then you could just say, I'm just trying to hit a target temperature hit the button and then it might run for you know nine minutes because that's when it hit the temperature and if it's cooler out quicker if it's hotter out that would be awesome I just didn't um, go to that level with it but great idea uh, so this was ground for the pump and oh yeah so the pump I was thinking about using a little interconnect like this uh, here so that we can disconnect and reconnect without going through all this but the meantime, that means I get to put the pump through here. And let's screw that one into place. So I was using standoffs here. You should really use nuts, but this was... Sometimes it's just easier when you have standoffs to grab them and twist them in with your fingers versus a nut, which sometimes you can't grab a hold of too easily. Uh, or you may need to use an actual socket, a little socket wrench, socket driver. These look cool. I, I really like these pumps. They have a groovy look to them. So this is a peristaltic pump, which means it's got a little uh, nub on the shaft that s sort of squeezes the tubes. It's actually a... Uh, uh, th there's no contact between the fluid and any pump parts. It's literally just a, a loop of silicon tube that's being squozen every revolution, which is pretty neat, um, which is how they make these food safe. No, no parts contact things that you're going to ingest. Okay, so the wiring from that pump we just brought in is... That's, yeah, I'm, gonna solder, I'm just going to solder these on. We'll ignore my little idea about these. And I know that this red and green. Oh, yeah, that purple was the ground for uh, the fan and Peltier cooler. So 
that's ground, and that's power. So I can take those out of those nuts now, and I will shorten those. Because those just need to run. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. Those just need to run from there to there. So let's make a neat little path for power and a neat little path for ground. Uh, all right, so let's desolder that. And by desolder, in this case, I mean heat up and yank. And heat up and yank. I'm going to put on some glasses. Oh, my iPad just fell asleep. OK, so these guys are brought over. And this is marked here. Actually, it comes marked. Uh, if you can see this, this is a red little mark here on the positive terminal. You can reverse these on these motors. It just will change the direction they pump. So not a huge deal. Uh, so let's give ourselves about like so. You can never increase the length of your wire without some painful splicing. So it's always go, good to go and make things just a little longer than you need. Chomp, chomp. And let's see, I still have the hole exposed for this little lug on the ground side. That's helpful. And let's solder that in. Okay, and then on this side, I need to, let me try a solder sucker. I need to remove this blob of solder to see if I can get to the hole that's built into that little terminal. There it is, yeah. And run this guy into there. We have about, what, 15 minutes? Uh, squozen. <laughs> I like the word squozen. It feels like the right past tense of squeeze. Having been squozen. My mother is Italian and uh, studied, uh, she has a, a doctorate in classical languages, so there was a lot of, uh, growing up, a lot of fun making up English the way it could work uh, based on some of that knowledge. Okay, so what's next? We've got, here's, let me pull this power over here. Thank you. Someone said the wiring is neat. It looks kind of cool, huh? It's not, um, not bad. Uh, we could also use some clips to hold things down against the board if we want to get them down and out of the way, but... Uh, so the two things we have left are that button, I'll deal with him last, and this is power and ground for the pump and cooler. Uh, so I am disconnecting. I'm going to take this and put it away. Hey, let's switch cameras for a second, just because we can. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I just put that, that second cooler away, get these nuts out of the way. Um, and... A neat-ish workspace is helpful. Try to clean as I go. Okay. 
So that's all cooler. That's cooler. And where is that cooler? Okay. Let me switch back to big view for you. A little weird that I'm working upside down. Sorry about that. This is how this thing sits. Um, so these guys, you know, I think I will cut them, strip them, put heat shrink on them, solder them, be done. I think that's the way. All right, so let's cut things to length. We'll start with power. Let's just let's start with ground because I'm holding them here. Okay. I think about that length is good for everyone. Actually, you know what I might try? We have some cool little crimp connectors that, if this isn't too thick for it, these are all three different sizes. Let's see how those work. Um, so hang on one second. I just want to wrap these guys so they stay together for a moment. I'm going to go grab a a little set of, I think I have these three-way connectors that are just like kind of a crush crimp thing. And they're nice because they make a good solid connection and there's one step to it instead of the two steps of soldering and heat shrink and kind of the prep involved with that. Um, are you a three-way? Wire tap. I've got a bunch of big terminal blocks in here. Here's three wire splice. Yeah, maybe these. Let's try these out. So, big camera. You see these guys, it's got little three little sections and then you just squish that down with a pair of pliers and uh, it does the job. So let's try this out. And I think you're better off not tinning them in this case because the kind of crushing down of the uh, wire strands inside of there helps it all stay together. Yeah, let's see. I don't know what gauge this uh, tap is actually rated for. It's probably, I think this is from our store and I think it's on there, but if they fit, we're good. I have used these or similar ones before with wire that was a little too small and then it just didn't want to stay in there. Okay, that's in nicely. It's even transparent so you can see um, if you are in all the way or not. Ooh, this one might be too fat. Let's try to twist it and see if it'll go in. Oh, it's not, I haven't stripped it far enough. That's why uh, the uh, insulation is big on this one. I think the wire fits, but the insulation was stopping it. It might be too long, but let's see. There we go. That's in nicely, and, and I'm not exposing any down here, so that's good. And this guy should go in with no problem. I would love to get a close-up cam that does this a little better or easy controls for zooming this one. This is just like a Logitech webcam, which is good, but it's not great for close-up. Um, so I know Lamore and Phil have, have one that they like. I might try to get one like that. All right, then you, while you're holding that, reach behind your back and to get your 
Leatherman tool because that ought to work just fine. And then clunk, it gives a satisfying, and then give a little tug on these. And they're all good. I don't have a good way to test uh, continuity on those right now because they're all uh, part of the full circuit right now. Um, but it would have been a, a thought <laughs> to have this in a way that you could uh, test out your, your continuity and make sure everything's good. But we'll hopefully it'll just work, but that could be a place to, to check. Just because I you know, don't use those as much, I'm less confident about them as I am normal soldering. But... It's fun to learn new things. Uh, Northern Pike says they look like stuff used by the phone industry. Yeah, definitely. I think I've seen stuff like that, uh, phone industry taps like that before, back when I was a teenage phone freak and way too interested in the inner workings of Ma Bell. The statute of limitations of which has all run out by now, I'm sure. Okay, so this is uh, the power side, and <clears throat> yeah, power side of the uh, 12 volt. This purple one here is the one that's the ground that gets opened and closed um, by our MOSFET. That's actually the, the switch that gets thrown is for the ground side of that. It is easy to make a bunch of assumptions and do this stuff wrong, especially as you're narrating it, but so far it looks like it ought to work. All right, let's put the difficult one in first. Ah, I went in great that time. Put that one there. These are pretty cool. I like these little wire nuts, whatever they're calling them, wire taps, what are they calling these things? Three-wire splice. Cold splice? These might also be called a cold splice. There's a lot of things that are like that. If you do car stuff ever, there's some stuff like this, or those little butt splice things that you just kind of crush until everything's good, but that's really thick wire. All right, take the pliers on the Leatherman, and ready for the satisfying sound? I'm going to put my mic close. Oh, yeah, there it is. Looks good. Looks good. Okay. Last thing is our button. How are we doing on time? My gosh, we have six minutes. I think we'll make it. I think. Uh, oh, you know what? You know what I'll do? All right. Because we want about six minutes to try chilling this thing, we can go a little bit over. I will. Um, will I? Will I do this without? Maybe I'll do this without redoing that button. I think I'll leave the button as is. So you, you can imagine. I do have to fix this one green wire. Um, Although that might just be for my LED, and we can skip it for now, but the LED that's built into here. But to get this through here, I need to feed the wire through, so I need to cut it and, and rewire that. Uh, and that'll take a little bit of time. So let's just do a quick emergency repair of these. And I will not even learn my lesson from earlier, and I will probably just twist these together and live super dangerously, because how could that possibly happen a second time, right? Okay, I'm just going to twist that, and I'm going to put a little Kapton tape there. How about that? There are no electrons getting through this stuff. I love this stuff. All right, go quick. Boom. Boom. This stuff is too thin. It's 30 gauge to work in my little wire nuts, so I can't use that. All right, let's start testing things. So... Can I get, let me get this camera down here. Uh, so, so, pardon the wiggle vision for a moment. And let's not point that at the light. Let's have a look. So this is the intake. So that's what's going to go into our... Uh, by the way, I've got some thermal paste I might use, but for now I'll, I'll just try the... Uh, this tape worked pretty well, but it, since it's popped off it might not 
adhere thermally as well. Um, thermal paste, if you let it cure or whatever, will work great. So I'm just going to set that in there. This, this will be an imperfect test, but all right, let's cut that and get some scissors out. Blue tape is your friend too, yes. <laughs> I guess I need cable ties. Oh yeah, Agent Smith, the, the phone company ones are filled with petroleum jelly. Yeah, they have stuff like that uh, for sprinkler stuff. If you do lawn sprinkler things, you also have these like wax and petroleum jelly and stuff like that filled splices. Cut it a little longer than I think I need. Yeah, I'll probably have to hold that because I'm putting pressure on that and it's not adhered. All right, we'll put our output beverage and slide the whole shebang back a bit. Output glass here. And I've learned a few times the hard way that if you don't, if I don't cut this to length, which I don't know which length I'll use yet, I may be better off getting a uh, clothespin for now. Hold that tube there. Uh, one thing too that I might try adjusting in software is do a little priming of the pump at the beginning. Maybe run the fluid through once to here and then pour it back in. Um, okay, so now we've got two power connections to make. So we have our, let's try this one. So this is our um, 12 volt and I've got this regulated power supply. And then we'll have the USB power that I'm using on the trinket. So this should okay. So there you can see, yeah, you can see that. Um, let me raise this camera up a little. So there you can see the very very bright uh, power switch that just tells us that 12 volt is live and, and, and ready. So that's, that's all that light does. And I have a, uh, move the camera for a second. I have a on board as well. I put that little green, you can see that little green LED there. That is telling us that there's power running on there, which is helpful instead of just hoping that it's working. So that means that that part's working, that's good. Uh, now I'll run the big question here really is, well, two questions. One, will this work? And two, what is my, um, go to the other side. What software do I have on there? Which we can find out quick and easy because it's CircuitPython, but hopefully I left on there something good because I've been doing a bunch of different tests. All right, that's good. I don't see smoke and fire. It lit up. It turned the little dot star that's built onto the trinket M0 green. And it powered up the onboard um, thermostat we've got there. So let's pour some liquid in. And I'll, what I'll do is keep it to like a just a half ounce so that we can uh, see a temperature change quicker because the more we've got. Okay, so that's saying that the, the liquid is about 20. Um, and let's put this back in here. That is tenuous. I don't have a good way to clamp that down other than, let me just do this. I'm going to get one of my big crazy helping hands things and uh, Use that to steady the handle on here. This, I think, this piece of it really is going to be cool when it's permanent. So, so using the thermal paste and letting it dry and stick there well will make that piece stay put. Yeah, these things aren't easy to. What if I have you drive this down? Okay, he's just going to prevent it from tipping over. That's enough to counter this, this piece here, this piece of tubing. Uh, all right, I'm going to press the button now and see what happens. What that ought to do is give us, I think, five minutes of cooling. Um, so let's go to this camera full scale. Oh, my tube is right in the way for you. Let me see if I can...
All right, so you can see it there, okay. So, button. You can hear the fan. It worked, okay. So that is now um, yeah, that's on there pretty good. So that is now working its way towards um, chilling this. And what I found is that five minutes, you get a decent result. 10 minutes, you get a really cold uh, drink. If you go 15, you get to like the bottom of the, uh, the temperature range, which I think was around 38 degrees Fahrenheit, which is around is that 3.7 centigrade, I think. So really nice and cold. Um, I should add that that temperature gauge there, that little panel mount one, um, as you can see, is only decimal uh, accurate to the one's place. Um, the reason I was a little more accurate than that, the reason I knew the, the results a little more accurately was I was using the uh, thermocouple on my multimeter as well just to kind of verify things and get down to the tenths of a degree. So we can drop that in there too and see. Okay, so we're at centigrade there. This, this will also want to try to yank the thing over. I'm touching the metal directly, so that's why it was showing so cold. Let's see. So 16.0. Yeah, so same exact, they're showing the same exact thing. Well, that's good. I'll leave that one out of there then. Uh, so let's let that chill. Um, I think, yeah, I think if I have the software on there that I, the latest version, it'll run five minutes and then it's going to pump. I think that was the last thing I tested on there. Uh, if not, I, I was also running it in a mode where I was simply letting it chill for five minutes, and then I was watching the temperature, and then I was hitting the button and letting it chill for another five, because I just wanted to keep piling those intervals on to see what it did. So um, unfortunately, these meters don't, we don't have a Fahrenheit version. So um, for those of us living in the US and other countries that use Fahrenheit, it's uh, a bit of a conversion to to determine what the temperature is. I'm gonna head over to the YouTube chat for a moment, since I can't seem to split screen, and uh, see if there are any questions over there while we watch our delicious beverage chill. If you look here, you can see the, uh, there we go. You can see the Peltier is now covered in frost. <laughs> That's getting whiter. Um, which is a nice sign that your thing is working. Uh, and like I said last week also, I think having a more, um, the more conductive the vessel, the better. Uh, so this is a silver plated nickel, I think. It's an old uh, measuring jigger. Um, I also got really great results from that sterling silver maple pitcher, but um, I think the other uh, really promising area for doing this type of chiller is with a water block. Um, so if you look here, these are a couple of different water blocks where this would be um, set onto with thermal paste or thermal tape set onto the cooler. And then the pump would always be running and it would pass your liquid through. There's a bunch of little baffles inside of here like a radiator. So we have the maximum contact area between liquid and the cold. Um, and these are used typically in CPU and GPU cooling on computers. Um, I thought this might be a cool idea for this project, but the fact is these are not food safe. And when I got this one, I started to wash it out a little bit. And then I smelled this really noxious, like cutting fluid or lubricant or something they had used in the process. And I said, this is way, way too dangerous to, uh, to do if you're gonna drink this stuff. So forget about that. Unless you wanna make your own water block or you find a source for a food safe one, that's not such a hot idea for, for doing this project. And if you look online, you will see there are people in the overclocking computers community who've done some fun water cooled um, 
uh, or water blocks like that for beverage projects, but um, I can't recommend it to people because of the, the lack of uh, the food safety of these um, factory made things. Uh, could be bad, could be real bad, so. Uh, okay, so the pump didn't run, so I didn't either, either the software I have on there isn't telling it to, or this is the one I was using that was telling it to um, just keep chilling. So if you don't mind, I'll just take a moment and adjust the software to just do the pump. We'll run the chiller for a few seconds, and uh, that's another way to revisit the software here for a second. So let me pop up. Here's the code. Um, and you can see this is probably similar, a little few changes from last time. This is what I'm going to put on there, except I'll drop the chill time down to like a minute. So I changed this to minutes because it made more sense. And then uh, since time sleep in CircuitPython runs on, um, sorry, now I'm showing it to you. Uh, here's the software. And since the time sleep uh, runs in seconds, I'm just dividing my minutes by 60. Um, for this pump time is just expressed in seconds, and this is 15 seconds does about an ounce of fluid. Um, that could vary again, priming it would be a good idea. So what I'll do is find my super long USB cable and plug this in. And the cool thing is with CircuitPython, I can actually see what software was on there. So could just be that I've wired something wrong and the, and the pump was being told to run but isn't. It would be kind of smart for me to put some LEDs that tell us that. Um, but let's check right now. Let's open up a finder window. And here I'll show you. This is the... That's the drive, and after last week, I think this was a suggestion that Kirby had, um, or a few of us were talking about in the chats. I know Kirby had a suggestion on making this somewhat automated, but I just dropped a file on here called Chill Drinky Bot, which is not the name for it. Now it's, is it? Yeah, Chill Drinky Bot. Uh, and that just allows me to differentiate that from another CircuitPython uh, device I have, which is my camera switcher. So when I plug this in, I just immediately see that name and I know which one it is. So here's this main Pi, um, and yeah, you see, I pump, uh, pump time is commented out on this one. So let me open up Moo and drop the, the real one on there. Whoops. So this I'm going to copy. And I'll bring this Moo over here so you can see it. Or Mew? I don't know how you pronounce this software. So here I'm going to change chill time to a minute. And then let's make this be 35 seconds of pumping just in case it needs to catch up and, and prime a bit. Uh, the rest looks good, I hope. Yell at me on Discord if it doesn't. So I'm going to hit save. And you can see here, there's, see how cam switcher popped up? This is the wrong circuit Python. So if I go back up here, cam switcher, whoops, okay, so it's going to be the top one. Chill drinky bot, that's the one. All right. Save, replace. And now we should be able to head back over and fire up. I guess I can leave that USB cable in. That's powering it at this point. Just step over it carefully. And press the button. I don't know if you can see that, but my button lights up. Yeah, you can see that. So that's a little light ring on there that tells me that the thing is running. Um, these are single color LEDs. Oh, my pump is running immediately. What did I do? <laughs> well, I screwed something up. I'll have to check that software. Probably someone saw it. Oh, yeah, so it works, though. Yeah, check it out. We have now taken the beverage from here to here. That didn't just chill for 60 seconds while I was yammering it, did it? I don't think so. I think I've done something wrong. But there we go. It's 35 seconds of pumping, and now we have our delicious cold beverage. Mmm. And that is the chilled drinky bot. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, guide will be out. Uh, I'm aiming for tomorrow. 
Uh, so check your favorite local Adafruit learning system for more details. And uh, I will hang out in the chat a little bit to see if anyone has any other thoughts or questions. But for uh, Adafruit Industries, I'm John Park. This is John Park's workshop. And I will see you next week. Thanks, everyone.